change your life. Do you want to change your life? Change your thinking. Change your life. Do you want better relationships? Change your thinking. Change your life. Do you know the potential of who you are today? Who you can become? Change your thinking. Change your life. Join Dr. Preston Rich as he helps you to change your thinking, to change your life. From the military to corporate to the classroom, Dr. Rich shares his experience and knowledge to help others be their best selves. In this fast-paced world that we live in, we tend to forget how special we are. Change your thinking. Dr. Rich says you are perfectly imperfect and uniquely amazing. And we're going to act like change your thinking. Change your call in or listen in as Doc Rich speaks. Ladies and gentlemen, your host, Dr. Preston Rich. All right, I am here with three parents um, talking about the George Floyd incident. We are actually doing a panel today. Uh, the panel will have three individuals on who are parents, uh, parents of males and females, boys and girls, grown men and grown women as well. And um, we're going to ask that the panel speak freely. We're going to ask that the panel allows each individual to speak freely. And uh, we are going to ask the panel a series of questions and ask the panel to answer those questions as honestly as possible. Remember, this is a kid-friendly show. So please keep our conversations PG if we can, and uh, but give us full discussion on everything that you think. I really want to hear because of the fact that I'm trying to put together a sort of a study on the impact of these kind of thing, these kinds of incidents on our lives and on the lives of our children. So let's get right into it. Uh, we're going to start off with you, Andrea. Okay. Uh, and uh, each individual will have an opportunity to answer each of the questions, but we're going to just start with a different person every time. Okay. Andrea, what was your initial reaction when you heard the news about George Floyd's death? Um, terror and horror. Um, I mean, that was one of many that we've heard about in recent years in our lifetimes, let alone what our parents and grandparents heard about. They just didn't have video or cell phones. But yeah, my first reaction, I don't know why this one, as they say, hit different. And that's, that's for, you know, the world at large. So, um, and then when I actually saw the video, first we hear about it, then I actually um, saw the video. And let me point out that some things I don't want to see because I don't want to see someone dying or I might get squeamish or something like that. But this one was important to watch as a mother of two adult black sons. And um, so, yeah, it was, it was terrible. Thank you for that. Um, for those of you on the call, you will understand I will mute the persons who are not speaking. And uh, so we can actually hear the person that is speaking. I actually will mute myself as well. So uh, next, John, what, what was your initial reaction to when you heard the news about George Floyd's death? So my initial reaction was, you know, here we go again. And so I wasn't surprised by the news when I heard it verbally or saw the, the headline. And so I was tired and I would say frustrated was my initial reaction. After I saw the video, the anger really set in and took it, you know, to a level 10 to where, in my mind, you know, was a breaking point for me that the confidence and, I guess, just lack of regard for human life and as he just held, held a regular conversation while another person was losing his life is what angered me the most. So to me, that is just basic, you know, human decency, even as a hunter, when you are bringing home food to the family, you have a feeling that, 
you know, you took something's life, and but you know, it's for the better good of your family. In this case, he had r- literally no remorse and was very cocky about it, which really you know rubbed me the wrong way. And as a parent, it immediately struck fear as well, meaning what's going to happen next, and that easily could have been you know one of mine. That's a good point. Uh, those are good points. You said, you know, here we go again, and then fear. Um, I, I I can understand that uh, myself, having having kids as well. Uh, what was your initial reaction when you heard the news of George Floyd's death? Did we lose her? Uh, that's what you like. Nope, I didn't. I didn't hear who you were talking to. You talking to? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> yes, ma'am. You, Jennifer. Sorry about that. Uh, I was probably in a fog of um, my own anger, listening to some similar responses. Um, for me, I think um, watching someone be hunted, and I think uh, John. I said it perfectly. It is. It was a hunting, and but what I disagree with, I think the hunter, meaning the officers, with an S plural, I believe that they did perceive a greater good in what they were doing. That is why it was so easy for them to do. Um, I don't believe that it was just another day in the office. I believe this was the you know, brazenness of a man who was on a mission. Um, the force did not fit the, the alleged crime. Um, we see that all too often. Um, it's absolutely unbelievable uh, that we all watch someone die. However, it's not the first time. And, and that's what I think bothered me so, is that in order to survive as a black woman, I have to compartmentalize the fact that my people are being hunted and killed in broad daylight in the street. I have to compartmentalize that because I have to work with people of, <laughs> that are Caucasian, people that are not like me. And if I bring that rage and that anger with me everywhere I go, it will be unproductive for African Americans would be unproductive for business, be unproductive for the human race. Um, so when I saw it, it pulled me out of that compartment and brought me into that room that carries all of those people, the Tamir Rices, the Sandra Blands, and everyone. And I stood on, on that room with now a new person, uh, George Floyd, and thought this room continues to be consumed by people that didn't deserve to be there. And it made me angry. It made me look at my child two and three times to go. It's hard to to tell you what to do because you could literally be doing nothing wrong. And it could be the mission of the hunter that he was just, he or she was just resigned to kill on that day. And that's hard. That's hard for me to put myself out there. It's hard for me to allow my child, now an adult, to go out there because I'm at a loss for the instruction. I'm an instruction person. I'm at a loss for how how we respond to murderers on the street that are hunting people like us. So that was my initial reaction. Great. Thank you. I appreciate that. I see all three of you have had similar reactions. Um, My reaction itself was pretty much a combination of all three of you saying, hey, this is what's going on. Since I have a younger son, a nine-year-old, uh, much like John, I have a nine-year-old that I have to explain to. And the first thing that he asked me was, Dad, did the men get arrested? And it was, uh, I could at the time that I was telling him, uh, I had to tell him, no, we're not getting arrested. And the thing that he came back with me after I told him about all the things that were going on was he said, dad, this seems like it's going back to slavery days. And I, I I sat there like, wow, it's a nine year old. And if he can get it, how come others can't get it? So thanks for all the feedback on that question. We're going to go to question two and we're going to start this one off with John. 
Um, and John, if you wouldn't mind, let us know about, you know, how many children you have and, you know, the ages or what have you. So we can get a better perspective of where you're coming from. Uh, the question is, as a parent, what is your biggest fear as it pertains to their interactions with police officials? So I have um, four kids, uh, daughters, the oldest, 25, son, that's 23, and then a 10-year-old and 7-year-old boys. So the conversations are you know, very different but are equally as important. So my greatest fear with my oldest is that, you know, I'll get that call, you know, one day or he will be profiled, which has happened, you know, several times in, in the past. So he's been driving my car and has been stopped and never given a ticket. And essentially they just wanted to ask him how is he driving, you know, a nice car. And so that conversation is really about, what I call it, don't have court on the street. And that means, you know, don't try to justify your actions or debate with the officers or anything that'll give, that may cause the situation to escalate. If they've de- decided to arrest you, they're going to arrest you. And then that's where you make the call and we let the lawyers in the system and do what it's supposed to do. And of course, you know, we will make sure everyone is abiding by the law. But the younger ones is very different, where it's more of just the understanding. They're trying to grasp how can a person be so mean, in their words, and you know how can a person you know act that way, and not really understanding the nastiness of this world. So they're getting an introduction into that much earlier. So I'm always careful not to, you know, watch a lot of news around them and things like that, and try to. Uh, sure that everything's, you know, right size, so to speak, for their mind and for, you know, their maturity. And so having those conversations is, 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 is tough, but you also, you know, they're in private schools, and so most of their friends, you know, are white. Most of their classmates are, are white, and so we are simply, you know, trying to explain to them that it's not everyone, you know, white person is not bad, every bad person, black person is not bad, and brown, et cetera. But explaining all those different dynamics makes it tough for them to really kind of get their mind around. And so just try to simplify, but the greatest fear that, you know, I'll get that call that something happened and, and, you know, today's kids weren't around when we had the gang unit, like in my day in the nineties, where you were always pressed by the police and had some very bad interactions. I had a, a gun pulled on me my first time with a police officer, 15 years old. And, and I'm, do not want that to happen because I feel that with the environment we have today and the racial tension we have, that can turn ugly very quickly just with words, let alone any resistance. So just trying to help them understand that they're going to face a lot of things, a lot of adversity, and sometimes you, you got to, you know, cooler heads will, will prevail. But as we saw in some cases, for example, in George Floyd case, sometimes it's not really the cooler head or about you resisting arrest. Sometimes it's, uh, it just kind of goes that way. But that's my, the way my talks go and kind of what my greatest fear is. Thanks, John. Um, Jennifer. Um, yes, as a parent, what is your biggest fear as it pertains to the, inter- their, the their interaction uh, with police officials, well, and let us know. Let us let us know what kind of you have. How many children? Yes, I have one. I have one daughter. She's eighteen. Um, she is a new driver. Got not a ton of experience on the road. Period. Um, she just actually was driving and had a police officer follow her. Um, for quite some time, and she couldn't figure out why. And of course, made her nervous with all these things happening. But they eventually veered off, and you know, I try to make light of it. Oh, they're probably following you because you had Texas plates, and we're in Florida right now. But the reality is, I don't know, and I don't know what would have happened had they stopped her. Um, my biggest fear is it is twofold. It is the unpredictability of the officer. 
and what their their rationale is. Um, you know, I where we're living right now, I've been stuck. And it, it went really badly, really quickly. And so all I kept thinking was, what if that was my daughter? How would she have reacted? You know, you give your child a set of instructions. I call it the talk. I actually did a did a track that I released to tell parents to have the talk with their children about what your procedures are to keep your child safe. And it, they may not be universal for everyone, but you need to have the talk that makes sense for your child. My fear is that that talk, with all in all of its glory, may feel a little different if there is, to John's point, a gun pointed at you, and you feel your life is in jeopardy. Um, so my fear is that the good procedures that I've taught her, if this happens, you do this, if this happens, you do that, that, that those may go out the window, so that means that she's less protected. There is the officer may not have the, better, the best intention for the reason for the stop. And when those two things collide, really bad things can happen. You know, we always say you keep poking the bear, the bear is going to eventually swipe back. And I think a lot of times when you provoke a person, um, then they react. And then at that point, the officer claims that they're trying to control the reaction when in fact the, you know, he was, he or she, the officer may have been the aggressor to the circumstance. So that's really my fear is that, all sides will abandon their policies and procedures that keep each person safe. And if they all do it at the same time, I think we have the potential for a bad outcome. That's good input. Thank you. Thank you. Andrea, uh, let us know um, your children's ages, how many children you have, and uh, let us know as a parent what your biggest fear is as it pertains to your children and their interaction with police officials. Sure. Um, so I have three adult children. My oldest is a girl, she's 28, and my sons are 26 and 23. And one's in the military, one's finishing college, and one is on her own working and you know, uh, taking care of herself. Um, one of my fears that, my fears have evolved. So ever since they were little, I mean infants, I've been having some form of deep talk with them ever since they were born. Um, and that stems from my background as a black woman who grew up in a suburban white environment outside of Philadelphia um, and the intense racism we experienced. So I've been telling them, my kids, that um, and my daughter and son, that, you know, don't do any sudden jerky moves when you drive, you know, when they started driving. And even when they were little, um, my youngest son has quite the sense of humor, so he'd act like, a class clown when he was maybe eight or nine years old. So I'd be like, you know, they're going to stare. Well, I already felt that they stereotyped him because he was um, African American. So I've been talking to them in some form since they were little. Uh, I don't believe we have the luxury of putting on children's networks and kind of blocking out um, what's actually out there because they really will um, profile us. Uh, one thing Jennifer said was that her daughter was followed recently, which means, as we all know, we got to teach our kids about what has happened before they start driving because we've all had that experience of being followed for absolutely no reason. Um, and I also agree with John's point about don't have courts on the street, even if they're wrong. I remember telling my sons in particular this. I was... Um, a divorced single mother for a few years, so I was doing everything. So I would tell them, just get home, you know. Um, so my biggest fear, to answer your question, although they are adults, is still something happening to what happened to George Floyd. Um, even though they, they take the precautions, they uh, um, are careful, they're uh, good people, they're good adults, Someone can still or will still profile that. And I just, you know, my biggest fear is I don't want to bury a child. That's interesting. I, um, as I was listening to all three of you, I wanted to actually, I think Andrea did it first. Well, actually, <laughs> all three of you have done it. So what I'm going to do, I think it'll be a bit more engaging. If I were to uh, 
have all three of you chime in with one another uh, because John had talked about don't have court on the street, and Andrea referenced that. Same thing with Jennifer. So I'm going to throw this out there and ask all of you. I'm going to unmute everybody. I'm going to ask all of you this question, and you guys uh, chime in as you will. Uh, just try not to step over each other. But I want to ask this: these two questions. One, do you believe that systemic racism exists in the United States? And before you say, oh, that's a dumb question, uh, can you provide an example of when you were affected by said racism, systemic racism in the United States? Uh, we'll start off with John this time. So, good question. Um, yeah, I absolutely believe that it um, that it exists, right? And has you know, sometimes it's almost as if we we've lived it every day to where I'm not gonna say we become numb to it, but it's almost an expected behavior. Whether that is the you know uh, the person of another race, you know, holding their purse a little tighter being followed around in the store, different things like that. Um, one of the things that led me to further my education, continue going to, into grad school, was as I was fresh out of school, going into a lot of meetings, being the youngest and the only person of color, it was oftentimes that I, you know, what I had to say wasn't important, even though I had you know, better credentials and more experience and and may have been my expertise, they didn't listen to what I said or, or someone else would have to say it. And a lot of time, my white counterparts would simply repeat the same thing that I said, and it would be taken as, you know, the golden rule. And so one of the things I went out and did was make sure I get the, the alphabet behind my name, the certification and degrees, and put that on the business card. So we stepped into those meetings. We had a lot more, you know, credibility. And it's amazing how, how that changes. But it just – it's uh, – so often you hear hear people, you know, a lot of similarities and similar, you know, stories and, and dealing, you know, with a lot of that. But overall, systemic racism, I think, is um, I grew up between Oklahoma City and South Central L.A. So growing up in the, you know, quote unquote hood and, and those kind of things, you 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 just deal with it on a, on a daily basis. So for me, it was more of a part of life and a driver and a motivator, you know, to be successful. And one of the things I should tell people, how do you get from the street corner to the corner office? Because you're fighting, you know, the uphill battle. Okay, Andrea, anybody, Jennifer, someone. Okay, uh, I'll go. Go ahead. <laughs> go ahead, Andrea. Know, I'm sorry, Jennifer. I think Jennifer said she has a delay. Um, no, no. System, systemic racism, um, to me, is the key word. Now, all three of us, well, well, all four of us could really say, how much time do you got, Dr. Rich? Because we could talk for hours about that. But um, it, it goes from, you know, one experience in particular that I referenced earlier is um, if my son, who's now grown and doing very well, but when he's eight or nine years old, running around the classroom, just, you know, talking to girls and stuff and being told that he has a problem or he might have ADHD, like, no, he just needs me to come down there and scare him up a bit, um, which I did. And finding out that other parents from the same school, um, where I raised my kids, other parents of color, would say, you know what, we talk. You know, they say, this is it about my son, too. What is that? So systemic racism, in that example, one thing that we see now is um, like the school to prison pipeline that so many people want us to fall into. Um, and it starts with kind of classifying a child who, you know, just needs me to say, if you don't sit down in that classroom, you know, we're going to do something with your hind parts later on, you know, but it's, it, you know, people classifying your child when other, someone else is a different color, they might say he's artistic or he's creative. So um, identifying the processes in the systems in our country um, 
and this country was built on systems that are full of racism. So um, that's the nearest example I can think of in terms of coming to uh, raising kids and how kids are treated, kids of color are treated in American schools right now. Okay. Thank you, Andrea. And it, and then I'll just I'll just jump right in. Um, you know, I can go back to myself as a child when I first started to become aware of what the 60s were like in protest, and I was just consuming like a sponge just that whole time period. And I asked my parents, like, how did you survive this? Like, it just seemed, it seemed for me as a child, such a world away from where we were at that moment. Remember, I was looking at it through a child's lens. And my mother said, it's just the way it was. Because I said, I can't imagine white-only bathrooms and white-only fountains and segregated schools and look on TV and people getting hosed down if you had a television in your home. You know, <laughs> I couldn't imagine those things. And then you fast forward, and I have to tell my child the do's and don'ts of what it means to navigate as a black person because why? It's just the way it is. And it, it is frustrating to me that in an entire generation, I can't give her a different lesson. I have to give her a very similar lesson as the lesson I was given. And it's almost as if we have this generational um, inheritance that we, this burden we've been carrying for slavery. We, we carry it. You know, we, we carry the how do you navigate in the waters to survive. We inherited that. And we continue to pass that on to our children because society is not changing. It may look different. It may sound different, but it is not changing. We're still watching black people get hunted. We're still watching lynching. We're still seeing it. We may give it a different definition, but it's the same thing happening. Um, you know, so for me, you can go from teachers changing grades and playing, you know, ignorant. They didn't realize that the grade got put in as a C versus what it should have been as an A. Um, that happened to me when I was in the second grade. You know, you know <laughs> what, what would a wow. Caucasian teacher benefit from giving a little black student putting writing, handwriting a C into the grade book? Because there were no digital grade books then. So handwriting a C into the grade book. What do they gain? What do they stand to benefit from that? And I was consistently an A student, not to brag, but I was. So that even if you went to write a C, you should have gone, this isn't correct. It's not, I mean, we're talking a, a small private Catholic school. It's not like you had so many kids that she couldn't keep up. And she was charged with 25 kids. Mm-hmm. So, you know, but, I will t- but there's lessons that you learn in that. Because when it was uncovered, I had a man named Carl Tebow, my father, who went on to that campus, and you best believe no grades were ever incorrect again. And so what I learned from that was, to John's point, you have to be the voice. You can't, even if you try and they try to ignore you, you you, you have to walk into the room and not allow yourself to be ignored. And sometimes that means by your voice, by your confidence, and by the letters after your name. But these are the lessons I learned from the injustices that, you know, that have uh, been appropriated against me. And I've had to do the same thing for my daughter when there were some things that just were not right. And, you know, and you just go, why is this happening? And it is the only thing I can come up with. And I love to come up with other excuses other than race. because I would prefer for us to be beyond a race issue. But I can't get past it because every other rational reason why, you know, problems have occurred, whether it's communication, conflict in the workplace, in the education, I eliminate all of the other possible scenarios and I come to the final one, which is perhaps they don't like my skin color. And I can't change that, but I can continue forward and hold my head up high. But I know that I can't change an individual person's perception. And I'm sure you're going to get to this, but the systemic problems we have, the root word in that is system. 
which means we have to be a part of the system in order to see a change happen. We can't just keep standing on the sidelines asking the system to change itself because it's already proven to us it won't change. So we have to participate in the system so that there is systemic change that we see. So I'll be quiet for now. <laughs> right. I, I, I like that. I like uh I like that. Uh, you have to actually be present in the system in order to actually um, make change. Got to be there. And that's interesting, John, what you said about um, secondary, uh, post-secondary education and graduate education. It's, it's a shame you know, if, they, if it's, it seems to me if it's not one thing to disqualify you, it's another. One day it's your age, the next day it's your education, the next day they don't want to say they want to use anything they can to avoid saying we just don't like you because you're black, you know. And and there's so many other things when I tell young young cats when they try to go get jobs, I say don't give them any reason to disqualify you. Make sure that the only reason that they have to disqualify you is not a reason like you showed up to the interview late, you didn't turn your paperwork in on time, you don't have the same education. You know, it's like my father used to tell me, you have to try three times as hard. And this is a, it's a shame that we have to tell our children that you need to try three times as hard as, the, as your white counterpart in order to qualify, not necessarily get it, just to get a seat at the table. So it's interesting, John, your philosophy of, well, I'm going to go and get my education so that I can get, you know, at least a seat on the table. and. This is actually spun into something that I want to ask the two ladies on the phone, on the call. When, when, when I heard John say that they dis- discounted him because of his, it could have been his age, could have been his education, at, before he got his education, what about, what is it like a day in the life as a black female in corporate America being discounted, do you have any specific instances where, I don't even want to say glass ceiling, but just downright racism based on the fact of racism slash sexism or sexism exacerbated by racism, or do you have any examples of that, Uh, Jennifer and Andrea? Andrea, you can go. Okay. Um. Yes, certainly. Like um, several years ago, uh, I was a rising star at a very large financial financial institution in Delaware, a company that is no longer in existence, but it was bought by another bank. But I was like in this, I was young, I was in this managerial program and I was being mentored by the three top women in the company, like mentored and one I worked for when I started. Um, but yet I'd go to meetings with my team. Um, I'd have an idea. Sometimes that idea was collaborated on with a woman I was mentoring, who was, you know, vice chair person at that institution. And yet when I say the idea that my, let's say, vice chair person said, Andrea, that's a good idea. I like that. You should, you know, do that. They discount me, like what John said. Yet someone else said it, you know, a white man or have, you know, I think we ought to do such and such, like a month later, same thing I said a month ago, um, and then he's brilliant. Oh, we should implement that. Oh, yes. You know, so we we have similar experiences, if not the, I don't want to say the same, as African-American men, uh, but we also, and and we have to fight that racism towards women as well, uh, women of color, but Men are perceived as more of a threat. Like when I'm followed, which I am, or if I'm pulled over, um, I'm not as threatening as an African-American man. So we have to fight those biases and systems and things that make the society think that the African-American male is so threatening. But at the same time, we have to fight with uh, causing anyone of color to be followed. So, yeah, that was my corporate experience, or one of many corporate experiences I've had about them. Bye. Okay. Thank you, Andrea. Jennifer. 
Oh, yes. I have a couple that came right front and center to mind. Um, I would uh, say the first one for sure. Um, I was at a uh, firm that had just been uh, acquired by another firm. And uh, during the acquisition period, you know, there was obviously a vetting to see who stays and who goes. So I'm in HR, okay? I'm in the HR department. Um, and so, and I, at this stage of my career, I'm a director level. I was, I, I headed up all of training and education for the entire company uh, for my part. And I was over diversity and inclusion. So that's what I did. <laughs> Definitely no small task. And, but we were acquired, and I'm speaking to a Caucasian woman who was trying to vet who stays, who goes, and, you know, eliminate the redundancies, which is just a part of acquisition. Um, I was um, propositioned that great news, you can keep your job, And we're going to um, give you an extra $4,000 for the year. And I'm not trying to sound ungrateful, but at the financial level, I was $4,000 is like pennies. So we're going to give you an extra $4,000 for the, you know, added to your annual salary. But we want you to do twice as much work. And uh, we feel like you should be grateful for this because you're a single mother, single black mother, and there just really aren't a lot of opportunities probably at this juncture for you. So I'm going to let you guys digest that statement for a minute. You know, a white woman basically telling me this over the phone who I'd never met was based out of, I think, North Carolina, which is just a whole nother dynamic in and of itself. But I said, see... Did she, it was almost like I wanted to say, say what now? Like, surely there must be a, 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 there must be a bad connection. She then yeah. went on to explain how the economy was bad. Uh, and so that that's the reason why she said there probably wasn't going to be better opportunities for me. So basically, you know, the crumbs that they were offering was the best, was my best shot at being employed and making a living and putting food on my table. And I thought to myself, how little do you value me? Now, here this woman had a bachelor's degree. I was working on my doctorate at the time. And I thought to myself, I had the highest level of education of the entire, of the entire human resource department from both companies. I'm talking about two levels above me, the highest level of education and experience. Excuse me, is this? So I asked very, one very important question. I said, you mentioned that you had done some, um, some scanning of talent and you were tracking, you know, top talent in human resources. And she said, yes. I said, why was my name not on the list? And I said, wow. there was no person of color on that, on that list. I said, the reason my name is not on the list and the reason no person of color's name is on the list is because you don't value people of color, the same way that you offered me this, this cockamamie, asinine, and I'll keep it PG, but there were many more colorful French words said. Uh-huh. And, it was bec- and it was expected that I was going to accept that because that was the best I had, according to them. It's, 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 the, it's the overt devaluation of the African American in, cor- in corporate America that is just startling. Why? Why do you? Why do, do? Why do you guys think that that whole uh, theme of here, take what you can get, and we don't really care about your education. You're still a black. So no matter how educated you are, why do you feel? And John, chime in. Why do you feel as though, what is it that you feel is the reason why they can only see us as our color as opposed to evaluating us in the same method or same standards that they evaluate our white counterparts? Hmm. 
Well, I, I think it's a, it's a couple of things. Uh, you know, once you were saying earlier, you know, about, uh, you know, black men, especially, you know, being a threat. So I, I think that's definitely a large part of it. And it's one of those things where when we, when we talk about, you know, systemic, the, the thing for me that really sticks out is this generational. So this passed down from generation to generation. They have their understanding and, and from their parents and grandparents about black people, you know, being inferior. And so that naturally, even though they may not have a, an active, you know, bias per se or be racist, it's, it's, it's almost innate or kind of given to them and younger is imprinted upon them. So that shapes their perception. We're all, you know, a combination of our experiences that shapes our perception. And that's, I think that's, you know, part of it. But definitely it is a, a, a threat and um, much like when you compare that to coaching, whether that be the NFL or NBA, you see, you know, very few, even though we, we know people of color have the coaching talent, definitely the athletic ability, but it's uh, something in them. I think that's given at a young age that, uh, you know, that's, that's passed down. But before I stop here, I wanted to pass on one where I was actually – uh, I guess you could call it reverse discrimination from a male female perspective. So back at the you know the beverage company we worked at, um, I was awarded a promotion, and I was forwarded an email by mistake by an executive, and down in the dialogue that he forgot to delete, it mentioned that we cannot give John that position now because it'll hurt our women in leadership numbers. So we have to wait till after the first of the year. So that was about October. So they drug it on and went through this long process of waiting for approval when by that email, they had their mind made up a long time before to give me the promotion, but they didn't want to hurt their you know diversity numbers. And of course, over the holiday break in January 1st, they announced a big reorg and, you know, the organization is not going to make any changes at the time. And that became, you know, my curtain call to leave the organization. So I've, I've seen it from, from both ways. And, um, you know, it, it kind of makes the whole conversation around, you know, reverse discrimination, discrimination, how do you, you know, strike a balance while keeping the playing field level. Because in my mind, the way I explained it best in the class ten years ago, when some of my white students were saying that basically, you know, everybody has the same opportunity, and I said, "Have you ever showed up to a track meet, you know, with a broken leg?" And everybody laughed. And I said, "Essentially, that's what it is." And to make a long story short, I went through some of the things that people face, you know, as minorities, and it really opened up their eyes to see that it's not, you know, a level playing field and if you're faced with a decision as a 15 year old that you have to help mom provide for, you know, uh, the family, or you have to, you know, cook and take care of your younger siblings because she's working two jobs and et cetera, then, you know, those are realities that you don't have a choice around versus they're sitting around in suburbia and never had to think about that before. So that was an eye open experience for them. And that whole class, just about business management changed their, their whole perspective. And if I can jump in just really quickly on on this point, um, so John, you so we, once you realized what was happening, you decided it was time to leave, right? And you moved on to a different mm-hmm. opportunity. But that's 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 where we hurt ourselves in the long run. And not saying you weren't correct to leave because you've got to be able to thrive wherever you are. That becomes you being the best example for everyone else Where when you're in a place where you're able to thrive. But you look up, this is from an HR perspective, you look up and you've got people of color who are talented, talented, talented. But some of the traditional markers that we use to look at, you know, are they going to be a long-term employee, our resumes look different. Our, mm-hmm. As talented as we are, our resumes look different because we're not going to stick around. We are so talented, we're not going to stick around for someone to decide when we can move up, when we know we're talented too. We just move on. But then it, what it does, 
we don't have this, you know, gold gold watch experience with a company and making a lifelong impact with the company because that's just not how it, that's just not how it's going to work for very talented African American people. But eventually, we're going to hit that wall and we're not going to stick around and fight for it. And I don't necessarily think we should, no. but it right. hurts how we look on paper. Right. You know what I mean? It hurts. I remember someone looked at me and they looked at my resume and they're like, well, I'm like, you know, honestly, once you've mastered your role, you mastered it. You don't need to be in it for 15 more years <laughs> to be a master at your role. Mm-hmm. You could be in it for two or three and have a lot on that role. So why wouldn't you want an employee that has 15 years worth of mastering in three to five different places that can bring that level of experience and expertise? Whereas one person who had 15 years but never had any other experiences. It's a shift. But again, right. and this is a different conversation for a different day, but talent's not just based on talent. Talent management and talent recruitment's not just based on talent. And and that's right. where we collide. Right. We mm-hmm. expect our talent to get us there. That's why we tell our kids you have to be stronger, better, faster, smarter. But at the end of the day, still that's not how we're being judged. That's not the hiring that's, that's, that's not the, the hiring practices. And so that's, exactly. again, what I go back to. We've got to be a part of the system because it, the current system doesn't include the things we're teaching everybody, be stronger, better, faster, smarter. You can be all of those things. You could be simply walking out of a store, be accused of passing a fake $20 bill, and be dead 12 minutes later. Right. Mm-hmm. right. We're, we are somehow we're communicating not all the right things. Right. Right. And, and let me just say that real, real quick is, is to, your, to your point, it was, Rich and I actually had this conversation as I was leaving. It, I changed my mindset you know, that time mm-hmm. around. I said, you know, I think the biggest way I could be a part of the system is to get a seat at the table and then bring everyone up with me. And so it, it's kind of, it was kind of an analogy of, can I fight from down below? How much impact will I have versus if I leapfrog, get a higher seat at the executive table, now I'm able to pull everyone up. So there's times in, in companies where I had an entire team, right, of people of color, and there was no one ever, you know, questioned me about it because we had talented people. We were kicking butt and delivering results. Right. So I think, yeah, there's, there's, a, there's some plus and minus in there, different perspectives, but, I, yeah, I can appreciate that. Hey, hey! So I, I, I've heard all, both, all of you say things about, you know, what, where we have to be is present or whatever. And obviously, we can't go running to the, to the, to the marble home to say, "Hey, uh, can you guys help me?" So it comes down to us. So what? And we'll start off with Andrea. What do you feel is your responsibility in the current state of race relations in the United States? What do you feel is is your duty, so to speak, your responsibility that you have to advance the current state of race relations or even have them tolerated or where do you see your role? Where do you play as far as the current state of race relations? Okay. Um, one, And I will answer that. One thing I'll say quickly about the um, two points that Jennifer and John made, and I'll be brief. Uh, I'm currently reading a book written by Susan Rice right now, um, not endorsing her for VP, nothing like that. I just, I'm reading her book. And one part of it, she says, um, she was actually taught by her father something that a lot of us were not taught, and that was, don't try to be three times as good. Just, just do your best. And why do we have to stress ourselves out? So that's something that I'm kind of taking as I enter my middle ageism and, uh, just do the best I can in any endeavor. Right. So I said that, and to go on to say, what is our role? Uh, we all have a responsibility. We, I see people all the time, and I'm guilty of this. We'll sit in the sidelines and we'll think, oh, good. Look at those kids marching. Look at the millennials. They're doing it for us. Good job, kids. And we have a responsibility. We have a responsibility to make sure that our grandkids, I don't have any grandkids yet, but our grandkids, great grandkids, do not have to experience the same things we are experiencing now. It's gotten better over the past 50 years, 
but on the, at the same time, what is better? It, it's not where it should be. So we have an obligation to make sure that not only we vote, for example, that we educate people who think voting is optional, that we educate people on um, maybe getting a ballot mailed to an elderly person's house. Um, I used to do that with my late grandmother up until she passed away in 2013. I'd have a ballot mailed to her house so she could vote. Well, you know, so we, mm-hmm. can, can I say something about that? So, so let's say we do have that situation where we can get ballots mailed. Now we have up in the White House folks saying, hey, now we're fighting, especially in the state of Texas, oh, the mail-in vote is unconstitutional. The mail-in vote is not this is going to have – how do we – because we see where that's going. In, in a while, it's going to be, you know, he's going to talk about, well, we can't vote this way because, you know, we can't verify their identity. You mm-hmm. know, what, what, how do we get around that? Because I, I don't know how it is in Delaware or Virginia, but I know how it is in the state of Texas. And if, if if Trump says three words, they congratulate him and say, oh, he's doing such a great job in these three words, and we're going to lead the charge in trying to advance the president's uh, agenda by saying, yeah, we're going to appeal this thing about mail-in ballots. And they did, and they won. So it's now um, it's to that point. Yeah, I'm, I'm well aware of uh, um, how things are happening in different states. I live in Virginia, outside a D.C. suburb, and... Um, in some states, that is still possible, especially for elderly people. However, we have to figure out ways to overcome. We have to be creative. Unfortunately, there are people who cannot, let's say, vote by mail because they don't have, maybe they don't have a birth certificate. Um, I was listening today that some people don't have the ability to vote in person or by mail, whatever state they live in, because maybe they were born at a time when they were born in a COVID-only hospital where they couldn't get a birth certificate. So we have a lot of hurdles, but I think it's important to answer your question to vote and also to I'll add to that, make sure we take our census so we have money going to areas that need it. Um, but we have to be creative. We can't just make excuses and say, well, okay, well, you know, we can't vote. Uh, now, I, I'm someone who I can go to the poll and vote physically because I'm, I don't have any health issues. I'm not elderly. Um, I just take advantage of whatever's offered to me as it's offered. If we get to a point where someone is ruling a state, people can't mail in ballots, then we need to get more people in office. And people who normally wouldn't run need to run. That's that's interesting. Thanks. Thanks for your input. Um, John, what do you think? What is your responsibility? Oh, on the current state of race relations in the United States. What's your responsibility? What is your active role that you feel that you should play in uh, in the current state of race relations in the U.S.? So I, I believe that it, it, it's a duty, it's an honor, it's a requirement for us all to be, you know, involved. And we all play our role, but just like any sports team, you know, everybody has a role, you know, to play. And... Um, Thinking of the you know the old utilitarian theory of you know what's the, what can your action do to have the greatest amount of a greatest amount of good for the greatest number of people and for me that that comes through coaching so coaching I have a you know a very diverse team everybody's trying to achieve a goal so it becomes mentoring so mentoring these guys year around week in week out and. Some of those simple things, the lessons come, you know, through, through sports analogies and sports performance. For example, you know, I always say no N-word, you know, on the field. And even though, you know, our young people love it and they use it freely, and uh, but I've got a diverse audience and I want them to stop using it anyway. So those are some of the simple things that we do. But just like any, any other, you know, great coach that you hear, it, you know, spend a lot of hours on the phone talking to them you know, mentoring and helping them get jobs and you know, telling them to clean up their, you know, uh, social media profile and the things that they're post because employers do look at that. So when it comes to race relations, I believe it's more about grassroots effort and it's almost each one teach one. So versus being, for example, I was part of the big brother, big sister program. I may have one, you know, little brother, little sister versus here. I'm able to impact and, and affect, you know, many more. 
and be able to have a long, long lasting relationship. Because one of the things about mentoring, especially with people from um, you know disadvantaged backgrounds, is that you have to build that trust and that relationship. A lot of times, these programs like to drop in, rah rah rah, make a change, and it's kind of like duck religion, and people go back to doing their same old thing. So, how do you build that relationship and start to really affect change? So, when I see the guys maturing and having families and all those things, those are the life lessons that they learn. And for me, how we combat racism is instilling the right, you know, principles and values and work ethic in our young people that may not have gotten it as they grow growing growing up. And to me, that's gonna be a lot bigger impact, but I still support everyone that's running for city council, going to the meetings, getting involved in politics. We need everybody to play, you know, in various roles. Okay, Jennifer, what you got? What do you think is your responsibility? Oh, I got it. <laughs> what is your responsibility day, in the current I, state of race relations? Yes, every single day, that means I have to show up. Every single day, I have to be seen, I need to be heard, I need to be counted. And what that specifically means is not me being a noisemaker or a distraction, but I have to be the shining example, the leader that helps to usher others of color, others that look just like me, in the door as well. And so when my daughter and I were watching the protest, I said to myself, because, you know, you don't know how your child's going to react to seeing protests. And I thought to myself, is she going to want to be out there? And it, there's a fear, right? I'm watching some of, a lot of people's kids getting hit with rubber bullets. And I'm going, does my daughter want to get out there? And what do I say if she does? How do I tell her no? Because a young Jennifer would have wanted to go out there too. Um, But what I had to counsel her on is, no matter what you decide to do, you need to respond at your maximal level of impact. So what does that mean? So that means, look, I'm, I'm educated. I have a large audience. I have people that listen to me, leaders. So it, it means I could be on the streets and be one of many, and I could do that. But I could additionally be on the phone, be in the faces of CEOs, and be writing articles, putting out published pieces of work that become true artifacts and evidence of a better African American than what you believe you know, than what society wants to say that, that there is. And so there are multiple ways to attack the misnomers of what an African-American person is. And it's important, though, every single day that you figure out how you're going to do that and you be purposeful about it. So that's why I say LinkedIn, man, people are missing the boat on LinkedIn and just being able to get their intelligence, their their own brand of intelligence out every single day. Social media, you have an opportunity to get your intelligence out in the atmosphere every single day, which can spark physical conversations, which should. We're missing the boat. We have technology, Google Meet. We have Zoom. We have all these different products. If we could host things, we're doing this fantastic thing with you, Dr. Rich, which is perfect, right? It gives people a chance to hear different voices all in the same bucket, African-American beauty and intelligence, and we don't always get a chance to hear that. That's why we have to be the content providers of what it is to be a leader um, for African Americans, what it means for us today, what we want it to mean for us in the future. It has to be purposeful every single day, and we have to figure out what are, what are my best talents, and let me take those talents and apply it to this. Okay, that's that sounds actually awesome. So we are here at uh, exactly an hour, and we haven't even gotten through three of our other questions. So what I want to do is I want to ask one last question, uh, and uh, if I want want to, I mean, I want to get you guys. You guys are a great panel. Uh, I want to get you back on uh, for some other uh, for some other things. Actually, to answer the rest of the questions. But in closing, I want to say, number one, thank you for uh, 
agreeing to be on the call. I want to respect everyone's time. I asked for an hour. We are actually at an hour. I mean, you guys joined at seven, so or seven at the top of the hour. Now it's twelve minutes after the hour, an hour later. So I want to uh, be respectful of your time. So I'm going to ask you one last question, and everybody. I mean, if you muted yourself, take yourself off mute. I want to ask one last question to all of you, uh, and then I want to um, get some information on you to see if uh, see how people can actually reach out to you because. When we put this out on the podcast, I want people to be able to interact with you, to ask you more questions, get you on panels as well. So what advice would you give to black parents who are bringing their children into the world in 2020? Let's start with you, Andrea. Um, Same thing. Our Parenting techniques evolve and change and technology changes, but I would say keep kids engaged, keep them informed, uh, let them know what's going on. I, I actually, I don't believe that we can, we don't have to show maybe a three-year-old a video of George Floyd passing away, but we can also explain on their terms because they're going to have to face this reality. So I say let them know what's going on in the world. Let them know how they can educate themselves. And in addition to that, I personally believe in education and giving them all the tools they need to succeed in terms of, you know, um, musical lessons, activities, exercise. But I would say that if uh, my kids were young um, or little right now, um, just keep them informed and and be transparent with them. Uh, That's what I would say. Okay, thank you, Andrea. Um, John, what advice would you give to black parents who are bringing children into the world in 2020? So bringing I them would say into the world one. in 2020, newborn. Mm-hmm. I would say, you know, number one, walk it like you talk it. You know, practice what you preach. Be that that living example because they're always watching, even when you don't think they are. And, of course, being present and active in everything that they do, you know, is, is important. But I'm also a, a, a realist that in, you know, womanhood, manhood is passed on. And so it's up to us to define that and define that pride, you know, that, uh, that self-esteem, those principles that they need to kind of have – and Jennifer was saying is that we it's up to us, right, to to instill those, but we have to be more adamant about it, more aware about those things and you know, really highlight it to make it a practice and then to improve. Generation by generation we want to to improve. So it's not always, well, that's how I was raised. How can you do it better? Very good. Thanks for your input, John. Um last but not least, Jennifer. What would you tell you? <laughs> what would you tell black I'm ready to talk. I'm ready to talk. <laughs> okay, go ahead. Go right ahead. <laughs> All right. So I think for me, um, and I have a niece who is just a few months old, so this is like me talking to my brother and sister-in-law, and it is to allow your child to inherit intelligence and not your anger of the past. Um, Because if you teach them your anger, they will not be able to sift past it enough to get to the intelligence and the solution. It It will shape their perception of today that will put everybody back into the 60s or even further back. Um, We have to be able to teach intelligent kids, um, and so we have to pass on facts. Um, it doesn't mean you don't show them George Floyd, but show them George Floyd. Let them understand what it means to be uh, where we are today and the things that brought us to that point factually. Um, the other thing, I think, and we've not talked about it on this panel, um, but I think Andrea touched on it, was being healthy. Um, you know, one of the biggest travesties for African Americans is how we're treated in healthcare. You know, the segment of the population that is dying during childbirth is black women. 
It's not necessarily because of health. It's because of the health care that's, the that's number being one. received. And I think, I think right, black women black, are the number one. Are the, num- yeah. the, number one mm-hmm. the number one women dying in childbirth in, in 2020, and it's rising at an alarming rate. And so I, we are being impacted by racism, but we can help ourselves out if we can be health, as healthy as possible to prevent some of those bad interactions from even happening. So I would be telling a parent, focus on intelligence, focus on health, focus on those two areas. And to Andrew's point, give them every opportunity that you, that you are able to give them. You know, one thing as parents that I'm really hard on new parents is it's time to be a parent. You you can't still be the person in the club. Can't be the old person in the club anymore. (laughs) When you have a child, it's time it's time for you to raise the child. Right. It's time for you to consider that they have goals and dreams and for hope and priorities and hope and all of that. And it only happens with your support as a parent. The way the way they're able to thrive. And so young parents have to be, and I say young, it doesn't necessarily mean young in age, but new parents uh, have to be parents. And they have to decide they're going to be that guide. And that's the decision that's going to be made. And, and I see the kids who had those parents, and I see the kids who didn't have those parents. And there's a disparity yeah, in how those yeah. children grow up. Correct. And then people like us have to try to be mentors to fill the gap. And I would prefer if there was no gap created. So, and, and I'm going to kick this off because you asked each of us, and we can probably loop back through. You asked us all, how can people get in touch with us? Uh, the easiest for me is to, is to follow me on all social media at Jen Tebow, or you can just go to Tebow.org, and that's T-H-I-B-E-A-U-X dot O-R-G. That's the Creole name. So if you just find that, you'll find me. And Dr. Rich, thank you so much for even inviting me on this panel. I'll do it anytime you ask. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Thank you for coming. Andrea, how do we, how do people who hear this podcast, how do they get in touch with you for further dialogue or uh, just some bouncing some ideas, you know, your Instagram or your Twitter or how would they do that? Well, my Instagram is busy Andy at Instagram. Um, how, how, I, how do we spell that? Um, I don't know. Let me see. <laughs> <laughs> let, me, let me just give you my email. Let's start with that. What well, we, is it? B u s y a n d i or a n d y? A n d i. Yes. Good job. Okay. Good. Okay. Busy Andy. Okay. Yes. And for my email is abfair11 at gmail dot com. Okay. And I let fair f a i r eleven at gmail dot com. Very good. Right. And I've enjoyed uh, the other two. At first, I thank you for putting this together. It was, it was, it, that's one way you're contributing. Um, but I, I, I've enjoyed my two counterparts also. I've really enjoyed listening. Even though I couldn't chime in, I was saying amen to both of you. So <laughs> I've really enjoyed. Yeah, good, good. And last but not least, uh, Brother Johnson, Dr. J, the other Dr. J. Uh, how can people get in touch with you or follow you or hear you or see your articles or what have you? Yeah, so my Instagram is jhjohnson1906, and my Twitter is the same. And I'm just John Johnson on Facebook. And those would be the easiest ways to, to get a hold of me. Okay, and if people wanted to get you on panels or get your input or get some information and they can just go there to find out everything about you. Same thing for you, Jennifer. Same thing for you, Andrea. If you have some things uh, that um, that you guys want to get out, please let me know. And if you guys have panels, I would, I would uh, gladly sit on the panel with you as well. And as I always say, you are perfectly imperfect and uniquely amazing. So act like it. And if no one has told you today, Doc Rich loves you. Peace. You've been listening to the Doc Rich Speaks show. We hope we've stimulated your mind and inspired you to be your best self today. 
If you've enjoyed the show, tell some friends and join us next time on this same station. Follow Dr. Rich on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, at Doc Rich Speaks. You can download this podcast on Apple, Google Play, SoundCloud, and Spreaker as well. In the meantime and in between time, remember you are perfectly imperfect and uniquely amazing. So just be great every single day.